And so can, every time you every time you're speaking or if the panelists please put your videos on so others can see you. Okay, I will hand over to Charles. Thank you so much, uh, Feria. Uh, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity and welcome everyone to this Climate Justice Charter Movement Assembly. Uh, today we are organized under the theme, the world in South Africa is watching. Why hasn't Parliament adopted the Climate Justice Charter? I'd like to welcome all our panelists and I'd like uh, for taking their time to be with us today. I'd like to welcome all activists all our allies and comrades, many of which have been doing many actions across the country, from Limbobo in Guyani to Deben to the Eastern Cape, Houting, all over the country. Hundreds of, of, of activists have been taking actions to mark Earth Day. And I'd like to say that the work you are doing on the ground is commendable. And in our effort to build a climate justice state, no action is too small. The Climate Justice Charter process, many of you are aware because we were part of it. Uh, we come out of campaigning during the worst drought in South African history. Now it's been seven years of, of, of campaigning. Uh, the Climate Justice Charter that came out of that campaigning was enforced by views from labor, from youth, uh, from the leading climate scientists in South Africa, some of which have contributed to the IPCC reports over the years. It comes out of social movements, it comes out of uh, ecological and, 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 and other uh, movements and gatherings. It's informed by civil society. As you know that last year, believing and having faith in our constitution, we took the charter to parliament for adoption because parliament is empowered as per section 234 of the constitution to adopt charters. Unfortunately, then we had no response from parliament until only a few days ago. Hence today we are gathered under the theme, South Africa and the world is watching. Why hasn't parliament adopted the climate justice charter? So I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, assembly as, as Feriel has already said, we will have messages of solidarity from our international partners. And then we will ask a, a very important question, what next for the Climate Justice Charter movement? I will hope to hear from parliament as we see that their representative has joined to understand why parliament has not adopted the charter as it has the power to do so as per section 234 of the constitution. The charter has been endorsed by over 248 organizations and growing. Over many thousands of people have signed the petition to endorse the charter. Many movements and social groups have been pushing on the ground to get the charter adopted in parliament. And we will continue to push still because we have to. As we know, we are living in Southern Africa, a region that is warming at about twice the global average. When the world hits 1.5 degrees, perhaps in the next 10 years, as per the latest science, we will be hitting three degrees Celsius. This will be catastrophic for our country. It will be catastrophic for our region. And if we remain without doing anything, then we are complicit in the destruction of our planet. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, too. Reverend Bassi. Hello, good afternoon. So thank you very much, comrades, for making your time to be here. Uh, I welcome you to this assembly. Uh, thank you, comrade Chair. Over to you. Thank you, Charles. Um, comrades, when may I ask that if you're not speaking to please put yourself on mute. Um, I would like now to call on, um, we would now like to do the interfaith prayers, but um, thanks, Charles, for that welcome and the objectives. I think it's it's you know it's been a year, and it's actually uh, since we handed over the climate justice charter to the Parliament, and it's been a very interesting year indeed in terms of how we've organised and uh, we've actually made some progress. Um, we're going to have uh, two people who will give us uh, a short interfaith prayer. 
The first person is Andre Naidu. Andre, can you go ahead, please? Andre, I think you're still on mute. Andre? Okay, there we go. Yes, there so, we go. There's a panel. Albert, I'm not too sure if you're. Comrade Andre, I can't hear you. I think we've put, um, maybe we can go on to the next person. Comrade Andre, are you there? No, we've lost him. Oh, there you are. We can see you as well. Thank you, Com. You can go ahead. Yes. Are you able to? Okay. Can you hear me now as well? Can, can I go to school in Cape Town? Um, and we have a client at a world food, which has been quite Come, in, in um, conjunction schemes that. Uh, sorry, Comrade Andre. Maybe it's better if you put your yes. I mean, you, it's better if you put your video off because I think we're breaking and we can't hear everything you're saying. So maybe for now if you can put your your video off and then you can do the interface for you. Great. Thank you. So I'm I'm here with with uh, the lady that is the South African that is going to call her name being Raisa Nul Mohammed. So she will be representing South Africa physically in Glasgow. So the, the following uh, player is forming uh, for, uh, at the COP26. Um, I, I think we, we, we don't have the equipment at the moment to be able to do the song physically, but I'm going to read out the prayer and the poem that she will be performing. It goes our Remembrance Day a stand for this inheritance. Our indigene family, past, present, and for prosperity. Lord, on this, our Climate Justice Day, I pledge all that I am. I am someone. I am someone. I am someone. I am someone. I am not a no one. I am someone. I am someone. You are someone. Every living thing is someone too. I am someone, if you are the only someone, you know that the earth is someone too. The earth, it cries, it gets traumatized. You are hurting my world. If you hurt the tree, you hurting me because the tree is someone too. If you hurt the river, eternal life giver, the river is someone too. I am someone, I am someone. I am someone. Lord, on this, our Remembrance Day, I pledge all that I am. To guarantee the future of the earth, we will instruct you of our plan. We will order the protection of all the seed and every living thing to reverse the losses and the pains that the earth is suffering. Lord, on this, our Climate Justice Day, I pledge all that I am. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Andre. Okay. That is powerful. Thank you so much. She, um, um, Raisa, had to leave suddenly, but she is preparing to to present that as a song and player and uh, 
for climate justice as our representative for South Africa. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Thank you, Tom. Um, the next person to do uh, an interfaith prayer is Comrade Kulukani Magwaza. Are you on? Comrade Kulukani, are you on? Yes. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let us pray. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father God, we come to you this afternoon with appreciation for your grace. We thank you that you have gathered us, you have gathered us in this assembly. We thank you that you have put us together and gave us a second chance to make your world a better place again. We know that when you created this earth, you created everything as good and you called it a very good nature. And you gave us a responsibility to take care of this nature, but we have turned it into something that is not as good as you created it. God, we pray for the decision makers to do the right thing so that we can reconcile with you and the creation that you, that you created us to be part of. We pray for everyone who, who is here, fill them with the Holy Spirit, inspire them, encourage them to take the right decisions, to do the right things. We pray for the parliamentarians, we pray for everyone, we pray, we pray for the ministers, we pray for the president, and we pray for the world leaders who will be taking the decisions on our behalf at COP26. May you be with them, may you remind them the importance of nature, the importance of reconciling with nature. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Comrade. <clears throat> Much appreciated for your time and your blessings for this session and for the earth and to prayers going out to get um, our politicians and parliamentarians to make some difference and change. Um, that's that's great. Um, um, I, I, we, we on the next point, which is, um, we have a representative from parliament who is in attendance. And I want to know, I don't have a name, so this is quite difficult, <laughs> but maybe if, if you could probably introduce yourself and, and maybe just um, you know, give us some feedback on, on, the, on the Climate Justice Charter and where it stands at the moment. Thank you. Can you do that? Are you able to? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chileka Matubela. I'm the committee secretary. I'm not a, a parliamentarian. Um, we got a message yesterday that um, my chairperson uh, was supposed to attend today's session. So I was just attending to, to check if um, she has joined the meeting. Obviously, um, the request was uh, late notice. We were not, as a committee, uh, aware about this. Thank you. Uh, Comrade Chileka, uh, just a quick question. Uh, which portfolio committee are you the secretary of? Is it the environment one? Yes, environmental affairs. Okay, um, I'm sorry that you got late notice because I think that it was sent out quite a while. So I'm not sure. So maybe, you know, with email, some things sometimes get lost or whatever, but we welcome you to our meeting. And I think that it would be great um, if you could send us, you know, some of your contact details because then we mm. can just resend. Yeah, directly, directly so that I can be able to advise uh, the members of my committee. That would be fantastic. Um, yeah, 
so so we can send you the climate justice charter again um but we're hoping that we would get a response from parliament this time definitely, much definitely. sooner yeah. than a year yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a pity that um, the new chairperson, which is uh, Faith Mutambi, had um, door to door engagement uh, preparing for the local government. So I'll check with her where she is because in Limbobo she also struggles uh, with network. So I will find out. But uh, I would appreciate it after the session if we can uh, take mm -hmm. contact numbers and then, yeah, we can chat after this. Thank yes, because maybe you can get the charter to her for her door to door. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I now want to go on to the session, which is the messages of solidarity from our comrades around the world. And it's a very, very fantastic panel that we have at the moment. Um, the first person that I'm going to hand over to is Comrade Nemo Bassi. And I think many people know Nemo and uh, have heard of Nemo, of course. Nemo is an architect and director of the ecological think tank Health of Mother Earth Foundation based in Nigeria. He's also a member of the steering committee of Oil Watch International. <clears throat> Um, he has chaired uh, Friends of the Earth International from 2008 to 2012, and he was a co-recipient of the 2010 Wright Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. Um, in 2012, he received the RAFTO Human Rights Award. <clears throat> he also received an honorary doctorate from the University of York in the UK in 2019, and Nemo has written a number of books as well. Uh, one is To Cook a Continent, Destructive Extraction and the Climate Crisis in Africa. I think people should actually try and get a copy of it and read it. Um, Oil Politics, Echoes of Ecological War. Uh, it's always, you know, I think that having, we always have uh, authors from the global north and I think we, we don't get to read enough of people uh, in Africa and in the global south. So I think those books are really, I recommend them both. But also the one thing that Nemo, uh, that people don't know about Comrade Nemo is that he is a poet as well, a very powerful poet. Um, so welcome Comrade, thank you for making time and I will now hand over to you. Well, thank you so much Ferial. Just when I was about to, you about finishing that, Wonderful introduction, thanks a lot. <laughs> My line went off and I just managed to get back on. So I'm not sure how well you hear me, but um, it is a big honor for me to share a few words of solidarity. I've followed the charter right from the early days, early moments when it was being drawn up. And I find it very inspiring, uh, especially now that the world can no longer deny that certain humans and certain entities are responsible for driving catastrophic global warming. Uh, and so we need a charter of this nature to hold those most responsible for the crisis accountable. And it, that includes corporations, uh, transnational corporations, local corporations, all those who are dependent on fossil fuel uh, as, the, as the basic energy source, uh, this document helps us to put in context the kind of reports we are hearing from the intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, that certain uh, impacts of global warming are now irreversible. I mean, this is really crazy. Uh, the, the world keeps talking about the Paris Agreement as setting a reasonable target, 1.5 degrees or well below two. Uh, but from the national, the contrib contrib this nationally, uh, determined contribution so far submitted by various governments in the world, the United Nations tells us that the world is heading towards 2.7 degrees Celsius. Now for us in Africa, 1.5 was already too high. And so for the world to be moving to 2.7, it means that the continent is literally being set I think we've lost Comrade Nemo.
We'll just give it a second so you can reconnect. Um, connection seems to be quite bad. Come here, Nima, are you back? You're on mute. Uh, this is what we face regularly here. If you're still hearing me, uh, I'll just round up. Uh, thank you for being patient with my connection. Uh, we, we're having a lot of issues here in Nigeria. For months now, we've been blocked off from Twitter. So I don't know whether that has anything to do with the internet system also being interfered with. And so uh, solidarity comrades keep on pushing. We are going to use your document. We're using it to share in our campaigns in Nigeria. Uh, we also like to push this during the COP in Glasgow for those of us who would manage to be there. I know a lot of our comrades from Africa are not going because of COVID uh, vaccine appetite. Uh, but clearly, 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 Africa is on the wrong end of the stick with the climate projections that we're seeing. And we have to speak loudest. Our representatives have to wake up to the reality that these meetings are not just for mere talks. These negotiations have been going the wrong way since the Copenhagen uh, conference that brought about the vote. Oops, we've lost <clears throat> Comrade Nemo again. Sorry about this, Comrades. I, I think that we can all understand the, the bad network in Nigeria at the moment, as Comrade Nemo has explained. Um, we'll just give it a few seconds for him to reconnect. Comrade Nemo, you're on mute. Nemo. Sorry, comments. Uh, I'm trying to get hold of uh, Nemo. Uh, yes. Yeah, but I don't know what the system is doing to me. So I was just concluding. Okay. Uh, one, one, one thing I wanted to mention is that Africa has not gotten a good deal from the moment the multilateral system shifted away from, from mandatory emission reduction for the big polluting countries. This voluntary emission reduction is heading in the wrong direction. And African nations, sometimes they don't even have emissions to cut, but they have to propose something. So the whole thing is entirely fiction, like the, like the net zero and the carbon neutrality arguments. Uh, climate change will not be solved by mathematics, by somebody pretending that their pollution is being offset by somebody else. I uh, will have to really dig for, fight for total shift away from fossil fuels dependency, shut down, no, no new oil uh, and gas uh, searches, either, not in South Africa, not in Namibia, not in Botswana, not in Mozambique, certainly not in Nigeria. The oil companies here in Nigeria that be res taking responsible action to stop pollution are moving deep into deep offshore where they will avoid supervision and where we only get to see the spill after it has damaged the ecosystem. So really this is time for us to promote agroecology, to promote people-led production systems and to, let, uh, to, to just stand with each other in solidarity as we push for a Senna world. Thank you very much and, so, and all the best as we push together. Thank you so much, Comrade Nemo. Um, as always, very powerful words and motivational for us to keep struggling and keep fighting and keep moving forward. Um, I think everyone would agree with that. Um, our next speaker, who is uh, supposed to be uh, Eltio Mantinere from Brazil. Unfortunately, we are having real difficulty connecting to, to the comrades in Brazil. We've been trying. And so unfortunately, he has not been able to join yet. Um, 
And I think we also had arranged for a translation with Comrade Fritz and who was, uh, you know, on standby to, to help us with uh, translation. Just so you know, Comrade Fritz, thank you so much for your time. But I think that uh, we're going to carry on and we're not going to quite have, um, we, we won't need to translate to Portuguese because our comrades couldn't, couldn't connect, which is a difficulty. It would have been very interesting. So we'll go on to our next speaker. And uh, the next speaker is Comrade Dorothy Guerrero. And, um, you know, the bio that she sent just does not do her justice. I know Comrade Dorothy for years. And uh, she's a very committed and uh, passionate activist. At the moment, she is the head of policy and advocacy of Global Justice Now. She's a member of the coordinating committee of COP26 coalition. So that's why we, we got her to, to talk to us about COP26. Uh, a lot of discussions around that about the, you know, as well, besides the issues that are going to be discussed, it's about the, you know, vaccine apartheid and some groups like Friends of the Earth have called for a, for a boycott, uh, well, African countries not to attend. Um, she, uh, Dorothy is originally from Philippines and uh, she has worked with social movements and campaign organizations for more than three decades. She's even had some time in South Africa. She spent some time in South Africa. And um, yes, I will have, oh, and one more thing, which I think I need to share is Dorothy writes a superb blog. She has uh, articles that I think are politically, um, you know, really good and we can all learn from them. So Dorothy, if, at the end of your talk, if you want to add the link to your blog, please do. Yeah, over to you. Thank you, Feriel, for that uh, uh, very generous introduction. I'm, 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 it's really lovely to see you again after all these years. Um, and, and indeed, every time I join a discussion, an event uh, in South Africa organized uh, by friends there, I really feel like coming home. Uh, I, I feel that South Africa is, is one of my second homes and, and, and it's amazing what, what you are all doing there. It is very inspiring to have this um, climate justice charter. It's one of the very, very, uh, I think, innovative way of, of pushing for climate justice. Um, not just um, through our organizing, mobilizing, but also putting it in, 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 um, in, in the primary location um, in, in our legal system is, is truly inspiring. And I, I think um, this is the way to go. And um, thinking of how far we've been um, and, and at the same time, uh, in terms of fight for climate justice, it, I, I, I understand and I do share that uh, feeling of frustration that uh, it, it's, it's often like we do one step forward and then had to be forced to, to step to, you know, to make two steps backward. Um, for this coming COP26, considering this is the 26th negotiation for climate change, it's, it, it um, and, and people, uh, on the way to, to COP26 are faced with the reality that uh, we've been seeing all these, you know, all these many forms of, of um, war, uh, red warning that um, we only have a decade before we hit 1.5. Uh, the, the, the situation is getting bleaker. And at the same time, we felt um, that we're losing, Power in that asymmetry of, of power um, conflict between states and corporations and, and, and communities and, and movements. Um, how do we really see uh, COP26? It is indeed um, negotiation, climate negotiation, or any kinds of intergovernment um, negotiation is, is often very, very complex. Uh, especially since climate change is a very complex issue. And um, for those who had been looking at it, following at it, the, um, it is very difficult uh, to really uh, see a, a way forward, uh, considering also what the, the, the UK where I am uh, living now uh, as host country uh, really pegged 
the, the result uh, was, was pegged on the idea or the concept of how each country's nationally determined contribution will come to net zero by 2050, which is a wrong target. It was not the target in, in Paris. And at the same time, th to think back as well, Paris is also not a, not a good result. Uh, it, it is all, also brought out from conflict, but it is not the ideal result as well. And, and now we're looking at, um, at another way how the goalposts had been, has been moving uh, over, over many years. Uh, in climate negotiation, the states are not negotiating on an equal footing as well. It is a negotiation between the hand, a handful of former colonial powers, as we know it, trying to continue their dominance while dodging their historic disproportionate share of responsibilities for global warming. And, and, and on the other hand, you have the formerly colonized nations that try to resist resubordination through false climate solution. But it's not just um, a North South uh, issue as well, because the UN also changed a lot if we come to think of it. Uh, for, for many, my parents' generation, they, they look up to the UN as um, um, a, a venue to solve problems. But we have to be realistic that with the composition of the UN at the moment, the nature of the states and governments that composed the UN as well, it's a different UN from the, the 1960s version or even the 1970s version. So the UN is only as strong uh, depending on the commitment and the strength of the developing countries in it, especially progressive developing countries. Because um, we have seen it through the years as well, that, that we are challenging, we have challenged um, developing country governments to behave like developing country governments and, and not behave like conduits of, of, um, of the developed, developed countries. So that's one reality as well in the, in the UN system. And sadly as well, you, uh, you have mentioned and Nemo have also mentioned that um, the global South has been marginalized even before COP26 even started. Um, the vaccine apartheid uh, sadly, the people that are suffering with this, um, um, it's a natural or, or not, uh, how, how do you call that? It's, it's not a natural phenomenon that there is less vaccines available for everyone. That, that there could have been a different reality if governments like the UK, Switzerland, and the other countries that have blocked the position or the, the, the request of South Africa and India to waive intellectual property rights in those life-saving vaccines and services um, had been approved. More than a hundred countries agree with that, uh, but sadly, a few powerful states who wanted to defend the interest of transnational corporations are still blocking that. So this reality that the most marginalized and, and highly affected countries when it comes to, to climate change could not even negotiate um, properly because they could not travel, uh, because the UK government failed in its promise to make it inclusive and um, provide vaccines to delegates and, and NGO observers. Uh, it's a big failure from the start. It is, very, it is unacceptable that the developing countries that must be there, whose, whose voices must be heard, um, will have difficulty in terms of um, bringing the interests of the South in the negotiation, uh, because many of them are, are, may not be able to travel. It's only very recently that um, many countries in Africa and Asia had been removed from the red list country category of the UK, but majority of the key countries in Latin America are still on the red list. So with, with, that, with that situation, before, before COVID-19, we are expecting 30,000 people uh, to, to be on the streets in Glasgow and, and, uh, and, and, and promote the ideals of climate justice. Sadly, that will be significantly reduced. I'm, um, I'm from Global Justice Now at the moment, working with a, with a, a UK-based campaign. And uh, I'm also part of the COP26 coalition, which has, organized, has been organizing these last two years 
uh, and we are now two weeks before the before uh, the the COP twenty six starts. Um, this fight, despite the difficulties that we won't we won't see the the masses of people that 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 would be on the street. Uh, we're hoping that we would still have a, a a strong mobilization locally and and for our comrades in Europe and those who could travel here to be here and and uh, push for climate justice with us. Um, for those who will not be able to be here, and I know majority of you will not be here, that we, we, there will be a global day of action on November 6. Um, there will be marches in, in Glasgow, which, is the, which will be the main, um, the, the main um, city. There will be uh, mobilizations in at least 15 cities in the UK in London as well, I ex we expect that it will be a big one. And, and I think South Africa is also organizing some, some action um, in, uh, at least in Johannesburg and, and, and maybe other cities there. Um, we're, we know that 16 other capitals, uh, movements in, in 16 other capitals have committed to join that global uh, day of action. So um, where is hope you might ask? Um, there is still hope because we are still continue organizing. There's still uh, the, the youth now that are mobilized that and were never mobilized before in the way that they are mobilized now in their thousands uh, that are striking and, and, and um, seeing the connection um, between their future and, and, and climate ch change. Because indeed, climate change is a generational issue. So, so it is very um, inspiring as well that we see a more politicized youth um, and uh, even a more radical, many, many more new radical movements that, that are springing up and, and, and also uh, mobilizing. So um, as, a, as a sister from, from, from here now, and then the fellow uh, um, traveler, comrade and, and inspired uh, supporter of the movement in South Africa. Um, I, I'm really hoping that you push uh, this climate justice charter and, and um, really best greetings to all of you. Um, more power, thank you. Thank you so much, comrade uh, Dorothy. Um, both our panelists today have such a wealth of knowledge and experience, and it's a pity that we couldn't have even more detailed sessions with you, because I think you have a lot of information and, and you know, to share, a lot more to share. So thank you very much, Comrade Dorothy. Um, I think, yeah, she, you know, Comrade mentioned some of the days of actions that will be happening uh, because it, around COP, and on the 5th of November is also a a day of action in Africa, so across the continent. Um, and then on, on the 6th is the Global Day of Action. We as COPEC and uh, the Climate Justice Charter will be having an assembly on the 6th, uh, which we, an alternative to COP26. But there are also meetings and, and, and sessions leading up to that, which uh, there's the, the, the People's Counter COP, which is happening 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th as well. So if you need more information, please let me know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, you, you, you raise good points about COP26 that, um, you know, there has to, we, we need to remember that the local and organizing at a local level and creating that vibe at, at a local national level is also important and not just being a cop. And I think COVID has taught us that we needed to find different ways of working. Um, thank you for sharing your blog. That's, thank, yeah, I think that if people can, they should please, you know, download it. It's really, it's, it's, uh, it's very useful. Um, so thank you again, both comrades Nemo and comrade Dorothy. I think it's, Vish, are those questions? I'm not sure what, is that from Vish? Yeah, Vish, do you want to just? No, that's, yeah? for the late, that's for the latest session. That's for <laughs> You're jumping the gun here, comrade. <clears throat> okay, so thank you very much. Uh, our next, uh, you know, I think also when we talk about the local and, and if you think about in South Africa, we're going into, uh, you know, local government elections in the next, on the 1st of November and we said this 
three, four, five years ago, that hopefully at some point, the, the kind of things we're going to challenge our political parties is about how they're responding to climate change and how they're responding to ecocide and how they're responding to, uh, to, to, to basic services that are linked to environmental issues that are linked to human rights like water, for example. And um, we have not gotten there and for a whole range of reasons, of course, I, I don't think there's any one place we can point the finger, but I do think that we need to keep track of that. We need to keep track of uh, what is happening and what our politicians are saying at a local level, because I think that, you know, if you look at the ANC in the last couple of weeks where it's so much of confusion, it's like, ah, oh, green energy, oh no, nuclear, oh wait, we're going to re, Furbish coal fired power stations. Like, it's just like, who are they speaking to? And why is there so much confusion um, in one party? So some of the other parties haven't even bothered. But what has happened, and we're launching today um, a critique of political party manifestos, um, specifically the ANC, EFF, and TA, because of course they hold uh, the majority in, in our parliament at the moment, and also in terms of local governments, they've been quite dominant in that sector as well. So I want to hand over to Charles, who's, uh, who's going to talk through uh, some of the key points and the way that the, the political party manifestos have been critiqued is through the eyes of this of a climate justice charter. So we have in our charter um, specific demands and specific issues on water, on food serenity, uh, on basic human rights, on eradicating poverty, on workplaces. And, and so it was with that eye that um, this critique was done. So I'd like to hand over now to Charles to, to do that. We're not having questions, but if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat. If you have anything for Nemo or Dorothy, and we can see if they can answer because we do have some time. Okay, I will hand over to Charles. Thank you very much, Feria. Uh, may I kindly ask a favor not to switch on my video? Uh, my Wi-Fi is already warning that I have a, a very poor connection. If sure, I switch off my now, video. now we're not going to get that beautiful picture behind you. <laughs> no, carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as as, as Feria has said, uh, we have looked at the political party manifestos for the upcoming local government elections, the ANC, the DA, and the EFF. And we have critiqued these three political parties using uh, the systemic alternatives for transformative change in the Climate Justice Charter. Now, the Climate Justice Charter is 14 systemic alternatives for transformative change, but we only took six of these 14 alternatives for transformative change. And we looked at these manifestos of political parties to see what they say. So the critique is within that lens as Ferial has already said. So the first systemic alternative that we took was democratic and deep just transition plans. Now the charter calls for democratic and deep just transition plans. But when you look at the ANC manifesto, it fails to prioritize community-based solutions to social problems we found that the manifesto still has a top-down and technocratic approach to local government, which ignores the lived experiences of the people and how the climate crisis is impacting them. Now, such planning is going to ignore many rural communities, peri-urban and even urban communities, and it will perpetuate many of the crises and failures of the past. The DA's manifesto in terms of democratic and deep just transition plans revolves around expert consultations. Now experts are important indeed, but experts cannot replace democratic participation, nor can they replace or undermine people's lived experiences. The EFF manifesto also fails in this because the EFF manifesto calls for centralized planning controlled by councillors. Now we believe this is nothing more than a micromanagement of democracy. And in the context of the climate crisis, 
people's lived experiences are of the essence and should be a priority. Secondly, we critique the political parties on, 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 this, on, on, on the systemic alternative of socially owned and community-based renewable energy through a rapid phase out of fossil fuels, as the charter says. Now, the ANC manifesto does not, does not reflect this. Instead, we see a continued reliance on coal and gas. There is absolutely no commitment in the ANC manifesto to tap into wind energy, which according to research, can supply eight times the energy that South Africa needs. The DA manifesto prioritizes privatized electricity supply, but there is no plan to phase out fossil fuels to empower community-owned renewable energy. The EFF manifesto has no plan to phase out coal and gas, nor does it have plans to reduce municipal carbon emissions. These three manifestos only talk of making ESCO more efficient. Now we believe that making ESCO more efficient in emitting greenhouse gases will only cement our place as a carbon criminal state. The charter calls for us to feed ourselves through food sovereignty. Now, the pledge to prioritize urban agriculture and community food gardens is something that we have been pushing for, is something that we have been fighting for, is something that many civil society organizations have been fighting for. We are glad that the, uh, prioritizing urban farming and, 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 and community food gardens has finally made its way into the ANC manifesto. But even though this pledge to prioritize community food gardens is in the ANC manifesto, at the back of our minds, we still remember the so-called garbage bandit and how he was treated by the ANC when he practiced what their manifesto pledges to do. The DA manifesto does not have plans to transform the agricultural system. In fact, in, instead the model they propose will keep the current agricultural system as it is, being monocultural, chemical intensive, continuing to perpetuate inequalities, continuing to, 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 to emit uh, a lot of, a, a lot of uh, emit, continuing to emit to our greenhouse gases. The EFF manifesto also does not propose transformative changes in agriculture. Their only plan is to the only plan is to help uh, rural farmers, although this is not clearly stated in the manifesto on how they would do it, but we welcome that pledge to prioritize rural farmers because we know how they've been decimated by the droughts. We know how they are, they are victims of the climate shock. The charter calls to democratize water commons. Now, despite knowing that South Africa's water demand will outstrip supply by 17% in just under 10 years, and despite the El Nino-induced droughts, the ANC manifesto takes a casual and very ignorant approach to water. It ignores the fact that 40, almost 40% 40 of municipal water is lost in leakage, leakages in pipes. Now, in a heating world, this cannot be allowed to continue. Unfortunately, the ANC manifesto is very lackluster in this. Now, the DA manifesto has no understanding of water as a commons, as the charter says. Instead, the manifesto reflects a party which sees water as nothing more than a taxable commodity, something from which municipalities should make money. Now, the EFF manifesto acknowledges the obvious, that South Africa needs rapid water infrastructure construction. However, they ignore the impact of the climate crisis on South Africa's water system. Typical of opposition politics, as one might say, there are more political points in blaming the ruling party than in acknowledging climate realities. The charter calls for eco-mobility and clean energy public transport system. Now, many South Africans are reluctant to use public trans transport because it is unsafe and often unreliable. But the fact is public transport will lower our carbon emissions and ease the burden of cars on our cities. Unfortunately, the ANC manifesto does not reflect this vision for its municipalities, nor does it embrace eco-mobility, walkways and bicycle lanes. The DL fails to prioritize rail cargo for transportation, which would ease the truck backlogs 
and 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 and, and the tons of carbon emissions by trucks on our roads. Now, the DA manifesto has called for sustainable roads like the Jeffreys Bray eco-friendly road where tar is mixed with plastic. Now, this is a welcome strategy. It could ease the plastic pollution in our country. It could be a, a game changer in road construction and in plastic recycling. The EFF has no eco-mobility pursuits other than the transport development of roads infrastructure using tar and carbon intensive concrete. Finally, the charter calls for rights of nature and climate solutions. Now we believe that municipal oversight is crucial in fighting polluters. The ANC manifesto fails even in pledging to, to strengthen the green scorpions and make sure that companies abide by the, re the regulations of the NEMA Act of 1998, so amended. Now beyond, pu beyond punishing the polluters, the time has come for the rights of nature, as the charter says, to be enshrined in our constitution. Municipalities would believe should take the lead in this. Now, just like the ANC, the DA also fails to prioritize rights of nature and their solutions to municipal problems are not climate solutions. The EFF approaches rights of nature from a liberalized perspective, which is a surprise. Their municipal protected area expansion strategy is a liberal approach to conservation, one that privatizes biodiversity to a few reserves. Now the charter rejects this and calls for eco-centric living and understanding that we coexist with nature. The EFF's plan to give incentives to companies that limit their pollution levels is at best misguided because what South Africa needs is a local government that will punish and criminalize companies that pollute the environment and violate section 24 of the constitution and the NIMA Act, not a local government that will give companies incentives just for not destroying the ecosystems, biodiversity and livelihoods. What these manifestos show is that our, our, our current political parties do not give the climate crisis the seriousness it deserves. Our current political parties do not understand the solutions that are needed at this moment. We need politics unusual. So we have critiqued the political fact manifestos from these six systemic alternatives for transformative change outlined in the charter. Now had parliament adopted the climate justice charter last year, it would have been a guiding document for all of these political parties. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you, Charles. I think that was that was a really, really good uh, critique of local government, you know, election manifestos, party manifestos. I think that uh, we will be sharing that with all participants, uh, and we also, you know, it's launching today, so we're also going to be sending it out to uh, to media and newspapers, and hopefully, uh, it will be there as well. I think that covered quite a bit of um, of what was, you know of the critique and I think it's powerful, everyone should read it. Um, we're moving quite smoothly in our program. Um, I, do, I do think that, you know, at some point we will have some, it, it, some level of, you know, interaction, but I think that um, this is an assembly in terms of we're trying to just get as much done as possible. I want to now thank everyone and, uh, you know, it's, you've been, a, Great, but as a facilitator, it's been very easy for me. I want to hand over to Vish now, who will who will talk about um, what are the next steps for the CJCM, for the Climate Justice Charter Movement, as well as um, there are many, many, many activists on the group that will be uh, giving short inputs. And I think that it's great to, to link the different sectors together, youth, academic labor, other activists, um, and I hand over to you, Vish. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Feriel. Um, <clears throat> Comrade, as Charles said at the beginning of this assembly, the charter is a product of almost six to seven years of activism during the worst drought in, in our country. Uh, we had a failing state in so many respects during that drought and, uh, and the crisis, uh, the drought crisis hit hard. But we connected the dots and we, we generated the charter because we understood it was linked to the climate crisis. 
Uh, we also, comrades, went to Parliament last year on World Food Day, together with many of you, many of the organizations and movements. We went online and we handed over the Charter to Parliament. Section 234 provides for charters to be adopted. Immediately after that, we submitted, together with our partner organization, the Legal Resources Center, a legal letter to Parliament, informing them that officially we've handed over the charter and we would like to know what the procedure is for this charter to be adopted as per section 234. For almost a year, we haven't heard from parliament. We then sent a letter to them um, way before October, giving them a deadline by the 11th of October to give us some idea of where the deliberation is on this charter. Uh, we have received a response now after that letter went and essentially, we've been told that, well, the charter is noted uh, and, and, and that's where it stands. Um, and uh, it's very likely that the environmental portfolio in parliament will start dealing with this issue. Now, the charter takes a holistic view of the crisis and you cannot ghettoize this as a narrow environmental issue. It's actually an insult to the seriousness of thinking, of activism, uh, of perspective that we are putting forward. Uh, and now we are at this point where we can see it in the party manifestos that the political parties are not serious about this issue and we are heading for worsening climate crisis. We are gonna go back to parliament. We've asked them to send someone today to update us, but they said they'll only send an observer. So thank you to the representative for being here. But I think parliament and the political parties must understand that we're gonna have to think about how we continue this fight and how we escalate this fight, how we raise the intensity of this fight because the stakes are too high. This is a life and death struggle. And if they don't understand that, we're gonna to have to make them understand this. And therefore we are going to, we're going to open up this discussion. We've asked a few activists to just stimulate us uh, to answer the questions I've posted in the chat line, uh, how do we ensure that the pressure is intensified on Parliament um, and the carbon criminal state? How do we build the power of the CJCM to ensure the 2024 national elections are climate justice elections? We've seen this happening in different parts of the world where climate has come to the fore now. How do we advance the CJC, its alternatives and tools in communities, workplaces, schools, and universities to ensure we achieve deep, just transitions? We can't wait for the state. We can't wait for the failing leadership in parties, et cetera, to lead this transition. We want to ensure communities, uh, workers in workplaces are empowered to lead this transition from below. So to help us open up the discussion, uh, we have three activists. Uh, I'll start with Raisa Nur Mohammed. Raisa has really had an important impact on climate justice politics uh, in her generation. And uh, she's been one of the, the key activists on the ground leading uh, Friday for Future Strikes in South Africa. She's now at university. Uh, she'll be going to COP as well, uh, representing climate justice forces. Over to you, Raisa. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'll be talking about um, what, where we go from here from as from a youth perspective, um, in terms of the CJC. And um, I'm sure like we've all seen that Parliament has failed to adopt the climate justice charter. And I think um, we are all in agreement that that is not the only failure from Parliament. Um, because the climate, because again, um, by not, it, they they didn't only not adopt the charter. They there's so many things related to that, and like there's so many like intersections, and um, the failures of parliament is like yeah. So how do we keep pressure on the carbon criminal state? I think. Um, this leads up to how we build the power of this climate justice charter movement and how we advance the CJC. And I think that's 
on the ground grassroots networking with communities. I think we saw earlier this year by the riots um, that people, South Africans are angry. South Africans are angry with government. South Africans are angry states. South Africans are angry because parliament has failed, the government has failed and um, people are still feeling the effects of apartheid. And what I um, experienced today with um, uh, like attending um, Andre's um, gathering, I'm seeing so many people, like so many small communities working within the communities with food kitchens and stuff. And I think that's how we build the power of the climate justice charter movement, working with people, working with communities, work, creating this collective cre and moving forward as, um, moving forward together as communities, as um, countries. So I think the best way to grow the climate justice charter movement is to just, mm, Make it into make it intersectional and really push this intersectionality. Um, I think as well. Like I'm in UCT and engaging in the universe, like in the university space, as well as engaging um, in an activist space in a grassroots space with communities. I I think that um, I've had more success and I've learned so much more um outside the academic space than in the academic space and i think um the way to advance the climate justice charter it's um and its alternatives and tools in um well I'll, i'm speaking obviously from a university um perspective but i think one way to advance it there is really push the intersectionality of it because from what i've noticed um and what I've ex personally experienced, and I don't know if it's the same with the other young people in universities, um, people in the communities, marginalized people, people on the ground are so much more willing to listen than students because as a student, like it's busy and it's difficult. And I think we all know that in university spaces, um, you know, university um, academic institutions like itself are very, um, exclusive spaces and I think taking it outside and emphasizing this like emphasizing that um the climate justice charter is a grassroots thing it's a community thing I think emphasizing those connections and really building connections with people and humans is a way to really push the CJC movement because that is what I've been seeing engaging with communities and yeah Thank you. Thank you so much, Raisa. Um, intersectionality, very, very important point, the connections between race, class, gender, and ecological relations, because the charter is about a holistic conception. Uh, it's about rethinking what it means to be human within natural relations, within ecological systems. And so this perspective is very, very important. And as she says, we've got to ground it in practice, uh, in building relationships wherever we are, in communities and so on. We also have uh, a, a younger activist, Natalie Kapsosidiris, uh, who also has made her mark like Raisa um, uh, amongst uh, youth and, and young people in terms of climate politics and climate justice politics. Uh, at her school, she led many, many actions um, and she's now at university, uh, University of Pretoria. Uh, Natalie, over to you. Um, <clears throat> greetings everyone, uh, really honoured to speak for everyone here. So um, yes, I'm currently at the University of Pretoria and today we did a small action. We're trying to build a climate justice society at the university. So we were out recruiting members today. And I think, yeah, my experience gave me a lot that I wanted to share now. So first on the first point that we're gonna talk about with the um, parliament has, you know, how parliament has failed with a climate justice charge and how do we, you know, put pressure on the parliament and on our government in general to, um, you know, actually advance the, the goals of the climate justice charter. I think the most important thing to analyze when you think about how do we 
uh, ask government to advance the goals of the climate justice charter is what is government's you know role in general and I mean we understand that government has fundamentally failed its mandate here the fact that we actually have to beg our government to save you know to protect our own future is a display of that failure of their mandate um and it seems that the only thing that actually the government responds to is when you threaten their power so i think what we need to do is you know we're creating this this movement and i think we need to you know make this movement bigger get um you know the mass mobilization going because then it shows the government hey your people are actually mobilizing here for climate justice they want you to pay attention to climate justice and if you don't pay attention to climate justice if you don't advance the goals of the charter your people aren't going to vote for you anymore and that's the only time the government actually starts listening right when their power is threatened so i think now we have you know we've started all these different movements all these small like movements across south africa um and i think unifying them and i think the action that's taking place in november parliament is a really really good um uh, you know uh, example of mass mobilization that will actually like you know threaten governments you know make them pay attention to us make them see that people care about climate justice we want climate justice and they're going to have to start paying attention to us you know when we mass mobilize and mass mobilize in that sense yeah and then um how do we build the power of the climate justice charter movement to ensure that 2024 national elections are climate justice elections i think once again we need to think about when parties like what makes a party care about a particular issue and i think once again unfortunately a lot of the parties aren't parties that exist because they want to um you know make south africa a better country make it you know more equitable for everyone in the country i think they exist primarily to you know advance their own ends instead of in terms of gaining power so the only time that perhaps they'll pay attention or they'll advance our own uh you know the climate justice as a, as a goal is when once again you show that people actually care about this and that this is something that's really important to the people of the country and then in that i think we need to not only grow the um you know our our movement but get more people involved as raisa was saying going out into communities um we've been i think the the climate justice charter movement has been exceptional in going you know into various spaces and getting support throughout you know all different stakeholders within south africa i think we just need to continue with that specifically um in my space where i am at university as raisa was saying and i think often when we've had youth um meetings you know we all kind of share the same experience that the institutions themselves don't really care about what we as the students want to do in terms of climate justice and a lot of the times the students as well don't care sometimes it is because as raisa was saying i completely agree you know we're so overburdened with work it's like there isn't time to actually figure out what we want to do with the country what the problems are within the country and there is a certain culture of ignorance specifically that i found within my university space so i think challenging that culture of ignorance challenging the apathy that has been created with people in south africa and specifically with the youth in south africa is something that we really need to focus on when um considering how we're going to build mass mobilization to ensure that the current elections are going to be climate justice elections i think also something that's important is on the day of voting or you know around that time when parties are you know getting down when people are thinking about who they're going to vote for because i think we also understand there is a political vacuum to a certain extent in our country a lot of people are unsure about who they want to vote for at least the youth who you know i've engaged with and a lot of people aren't voting because they don't see anyone that represents them um i think we can use that as a tool to mobilize to say hey look if you don't pay attention to the issues that we're facing not only are people not going to vote for you but people are just not going to vote you're creating culture of apathy and that apathy needs to be broken and onto the last point about how we advance the climate justice charter in communities workplaces schools and universities so again i'm speaking from personal experience um obviously most of the spaces that i've engaged in climate justice are going to be youth spaces throughout my time at school and now at university i think it's also important once again to think about what the context is of the situation so for example at school with the youth the most important thing was 
And I think in university as well, people don't actually understand what climate justice is. We've like, I know a lot of people work so hard to advance, you know, climate justice and create awareness about it, but a lot of people still don't understand the holistic nature of climate justice and specifically with the charter and the intersectionality, which is so important, the fundamental aspect, as Raisa was saying, of climate justice. So I think one of the good suggestions we had again when we had a youth assembly that Raisa actually suggested was that we would have um, workshops um, that people could attend. And they said, Raisa said that in Cape Town, they've been having workshops called Youth Against the System, I think it was. And I really think that those kind of workshops where you have people from different parts of different, you know, parts of society, but all youth coming together and actually learning about, first of all, like what the problems are of our current system. Because once again, what I found in my university specifically, I'm um, sorry, Raisa just sent me a message. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so what I found in our university space specifically, not only the culture of ignorance, but also the fact that people don't want to learn more so they don't know and they don't want to learn more and you have to break that within the youth you have to make people passionate about creating a better future and the way to do that is through like um having discussions and you know creating awareness about something and i think workshops are a really great way to do that so if we had workshops for example around here in packfield very needed you know people need to start discussing how major the problems are that we have within our society and how we can actually go about solving that and how specifically the climate justice charter movement is a revolutionary way to actually you know build a better future for our country and i think once you start you know instilling that passion in the youth especially we're going to really really grow and we're going to create this mass mobilization that i think we so need so yes i think we're doing a great job and i think we can carry on in that sense thank you so much for having me and letting me talk and share yes thank you natalie for your inspiring work as well and for building um if you like um and breaking ground and 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 a new ground for student politics uh championing the idea of a climate justice charter movement student society it's gaining traction uh at wits it's gaining traction in other campuses uh, and let's move in this direction uh, youth politics, youth power is going to shape this country, shape this shape our future, and shape shape the charter movement. Um, education and capacity building, the gap. Yes, we've got a lot of work to do, and we've got to do that in grassroots struggle. I'm going to hand over to Stephen Murray, uh, who's from the Eco Socialist Collective. Stephen has journeyed with us from the start as well with the climate justice charter process. Uh, they've mobilized when we tackled Sasol and protested outside Sasol, etc. And they are also doing amazing work in several grassroots communities. So, Stephen, just your reflections and thoughts about where we go next. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I'll put my video off. I feel more comfortable just talking. Um, I'm desperately in need of new dentures. Um, even though my life partner has a medical aid and I'm on her medical aid, the medical aid won't pay for it. So um, that's been one of the nice things about um, having masks as well, is that I can go out without feeling so self-conscious. But anyway, um, you know, these, are, these are very big questions that are being asked here. Um, how do we put pressure on the carbon criminal state? Um, we've been to Sassol before. I think we can go back to Sassol again. Um, there's ESCOM, there's Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Um, so I suppose if we could really pick out the real worst um, of the carbon criminals, including um, our minister of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. So certainly more pickets, pamphlets, social media campaigns, including making more use of WhatsApp as a way of spreading um, messages. Um, yeah, and as um, Nemo Bassi was saying earlier on, how do we hold them accountable? Um, you know, pickets, demonstrations, marches can go so far. Do, um, do we need to go and start chaining, padlocking ourselves to the gates of these places? Um, you know, it might have to get to some 
kind of more drastic action that actually gets taken against uh, the carbon criminals. Um, there's also making more use of art, drama, and music. I know Raisa and uh, the people who came through Extinction Rebellion had some very, very creative um, ways of putting messages across. And I think that's a very powerful medium. Music too, that we really need to harness more of that creativity to really get the message across. And second question, how do we build the power of the CJCM to ensure that 2024 national elections are climate justice elections? I, I think for me personally, uh, the need for a, a new viable, credible left eco-socialist political party is more urgent than ever before. We did want to register our sharp eco-socialist collective as a party to contest the upcoming local government elections just in the city of Joburg Metro, just to gain experience and to get our hands dirty. But unfortunately, we didn't get our act together in time. So we're just taking a bit of a longer term view, but we would really like to work towards um, the establishment of a new left party in this country and very, very inspired, particularly by what the, the, is it the Makana Citizens Front is doing in Makanda there. I really, I think what they're doing is so inspiring. It's an example of a new kind of politics that comes out of grassroots activism and offers a, a real viable alternative to the political dispensation as they are. Um, there's also the ICORA group in what used to be Queenstown, I think, Komani now. So I, I think those are very, very inspiring. And hopefully by 2024, um, all these different forces can come together and we can offer a, a real viable alternative. And then quickly, number three, how do we advance the CJC, its alternatives and the tools in communities, workplaces, schools, and universities to ensure we achieve a deep just transition? Um, I suppose for myself personally, as an avid vegetable gardener, organic vegetable gardener, I, I see myself working on that level. We had a nice seed swap this morning at Sunny Morgan's place. Um, I do keep back seeds and I share seeds. There's some people down in Ponderland who grow some of my gem squashes and baby marrows and green beans and things like that. Um, yeah, listening campaigns, I think are gonna be very, very important going forwards. But then also just, I've been trying to do a little bit of homework here. Um, received this amazing box from Copac full of the most incredible material that's been built up over the years, grassroots activism. Um, this is my homework at the moment. And uh, there are quite a few of them here. Um, but um, this is the one I'm working on now here. It's the Food Sovereignty for the Right to Food, a Guide to Grassroots Activism. And it just contains such a wealth of useful tips, information. And I would really like to see workshops starting to happen around these issues here. Um, there are a couple of um, initiatives um, in the area where I live, which is Lombardy East. We, we're right next to Alex, the East Bank, where there's the Lennon Drive organic vegetable garden there, which some women um, converted. It was, a, it was an illegal dumping site before. Now it's a, quite an active and pr productive garden there. So carrying on to support initiatives like that going forwards. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and yes, you know, uh, we have to intensify the struggle against the carbon criminals and revisiting some of these institutions. Rolling action for next year is very, very crucial for our program. Uh, and, and, and that's a very important point. Yes, we don't have an ecologically grounded political party in South Africa. None of them uh, have a conception of ecology, and uh, and that is a political gap and 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 the space in South Africa. 
Um, we cannot lobby our way out of the climate crisis, but I think this is a very big question. Uh, it's a big challenge. And so we have to debate it and unpack uh, where we go. Uh, do we take the leap into institutional politics, given that we have carbon criminal parties and carbon criminal politicians who are not going to solve this problem? So this is a very, very serious issue we have to think about. Uh, and of course, uh, grassroots activism coming through very strongly. I'm going to now hand over to Awande, our last sort of speaker to provoke all of us, um, to stimulate us before I hand over to all of you to give uh, your feedback. Uh, Awande is one of the lead organizers at COPAC and of the Climate Justice Charter Movement and active in food sovereignty campaigning. Over to you, Awande. Thank you very much. Um, I, feel, I feel that this is a great place for us to ask these questions right now. Where to next for the Climate Justice Charter Movement? The inputs that we've been given today throughout this afternoon, um, beginning where we began with the prayer, or the prayers, sorry, for uh, the hope that we have for our current moment and where we can go, a future um, where we see ourselves as connected to this earth, but one where we are also able to protect and maintain the space that we have in the, in, in the cosmos um, for us to be able to overturn the current moment where we are um, moving towards destruction. Uh, our inputs from our international comrades um, helping to connect and uh, remind us that the struggle is a global struggle. It is one that is not done in isolation. Um, the input that we had on the party manifestos and the critiques of these carbon criminal um, parties, uh, these political entities which would seek to um, exploit the pain and anger of our citizens, but fail to draw the kind of connections of this serious existential threat, this all holistic connecting existential threat um, of the climate crisis. And to this point where we ask ourselves where to next for the CJCM. Um, Parliament has failed to adopt the Climate Justice Charter movement, or the Climate Justice Charter, sorry. Um, this time last year, on this exact day last year, we handed over the Charter to Parliament um, with a hope and understanding that in our, participata our participation within our democratic processes, our democratic rights, um, to engage with Parliament, to engage with our nation's legislature and its political leaders, that we as citizens of South Africa who seek um, a more inclusive, uh, equal and safe world, one where we ensure that we minimize the risks of climate harm that our citizens are sure to face. Um, we engage with that spirit, um, but here we are a year later and we have still not heard from our states with regards to their thoughts whether to even reject the Climate Justice Charter um, as it is, but just their thoughts on what we as South African citizens have reached out to them in our hopes to say, um, take us seriously, take this issue seriously. So how do we maintain the pressure on these carbon criminal states? And I think that uh, a lot of the speakers who preceded me, um, just to echo some of the words that they brought about and to hammer them home, um, is we have to, take this struggle further. We have to realize that what we have in front of us um, is a march, unfortunately a long march in a short amount of time that we have to turn things around, but a march nonetheless. We have a lot of work to do with regards to connecting um, and educating our fellow citizens as to how all the issues and things that we are alive to with regards to our frustrations concerning our state are also intrinsically linked to um, the situation regarding the climate crisis. I think that the South African citizens and, our, and our, our, our citizenry is not one which is um, fully apathetic um, as we may think that they are. And there is a level of apathy, uh, apathy that we must contend with. But I think that our people are angry. I think that South Africans are tired. Um, I think that South Africans are also fatigued of not being taken seriously. Um, they are fatigued um, with a system or a, a, a group of leaders who speak uh, to one thing on one side, but do 
um, something else on the other, which is to ignore and continue to ignore um, the seriousness of what we are grappling with as a country. And I think that we should not take that fatigue, that tiredness, we should not take it lightly. Um, and we should also not confuse it with apathy. But what it means is that for us as activists, for us as climate justice activists, um, we see where we are needed and it is there to help connect our people to what the struggle means for them, um, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. And I think that's what the role of a climate justice activist is, to help show that this is a long-term struggle and a long-term fight. And with this also comes the ways in which we have to continue pushing, uh, putting pressure on our states, the carbon criminal states. As Vish was saying right now, uh, there are new debates or not particularly new debates, but debates which must be had right now. Do we institutionalize our climate justice activism? How do we take this further? Do we um, go within fully the electoral system of um, our democratic system? Do we take that as a route through which we push our pressure and our activism through? I think it is time for us to take those debates forward and for us to have these debates because as Vish said, we cannot um, lobby our way through this crisis. We cannot continue just to knock on the window of these institutions of power, hoping for them to just open up a little bit to hear what we have to say. Um, we need to think about how as climate activists, we can also find our way into being able to take that power of the state and return it to the people through a number of ways, um, as Charles said, with regards to his critique of bringing in communities and bringing in the people to the fore. How do we build the power of the climate justice charter movement to ensure the 2024 national elections are climate justice elections? And this is off the back of what I was saying with regards to how we put the pressure on the carbon states. The only way in which we can make sure that those elections are climate justice elections is if we do not leave the responsibility, um, the political work to these parties. The only way forward, and this is a debate that I'm putting forward and one that I'm using to provoke uh, thoughts amongst climate justice activists is that we need to see climate justice activists in power, whether that be through independent candidates or through groups that would come together to um, compete within these elections. We cannot have a climate justice election uh, without having climate justice conscious people within the positions to run in those elections. And not to say that we do not continue putting pressure on the other parties that exist, but we need to show our frustration um, through the way in which we participate with these processes, but not to outsource them to other entities who we hope would take that responsibility on our behalf. We need to make sure that we can put them to the fire and understand that this is what we require and this is what we need. Because if we do not have a 2024 national elections that are climate justice centered or focused, we'll be losing a lot of valuable time to which we currently still have for us as South Africans to turn our course and approach this crisis in a way in which we need to approach it. How do we advance the climate justice charter its alternatives and tools in communities, workplaces, schools, universities to ensure we achieve a deep just transition. And this is part of the activism work, which not only builds the movement, but also ensures that the 2024 national elections are a climate justice election. We have to take the charter to our communities. We have to take the charter to our families, our workplaces, our schools, and our institutions of learning. The fact that we have taken and the charter and handed it over to both parliaments and the local governments in the past year is an indication of the seriousness and through which we want this issue to be understood and to be approached. But it's not only for it to be transferred at that level, we have to also take it to the everyday level. When we speak about the grassroots, the grassroots looks like that. It looks like our schools, it looks like our workplaces, it looks like our communities. And that's where the charter needs to go. That's where the charter needs to be understood, where the charter also must be accepted. 
because that is where power from below comes up and that's where it comes through. When we take this charter, this vision for our future, this just vision for our future to these spaces, and that's how power from below will look and that's how the real change will come about. I believe that this is more important to some degree, I would say, um, than when we believe that we can initiate power change through the ballot box. We are currently in the election season. Uh, if you listen to your news, you listen to your radio, um, the message is that this is the only moment or the only time that we as South Africans are able to um, effect change where our voice should be heard. And I do not believe that is a sign of a true democracy is that once every couple of years, we sign an X next to a name and that is a sign of our participation and our place within the state. True deep democracy and a true deep just transition will only come through if we can take the charter to these spaces, to our communities, to our families, our workplaces and our schools. That is where the true democratic process comes through because I believe that is the foundation through which we will have the next four years become a real change for climate justice uh, movements in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Awande. Uh, just to share this before I open it up uh, to the plenary and for your feedback um, as activists, as committed uh, part uh, member organizations of the CJCM. So this past week, I had an engagement with trade unionists at uh, Wits University, teaching them a course. Uh, it's part of a 10 year commitment that I've been involved with and, uh, and spent a lot of time on the climate crisis with these trade union leaders. Um, they come from um, Solidarity, they come from SAFTU, they come from COSATU, et cetera. And what was interesting is after exposing them to climate crisis, uh, science and the worsening climate crisis, et cetera, and alluding to the charter and what it has to offer, uh, the, the week I spent with them uh, resolved that they really want to now get involved uh, in the climate justice charter movement. They want to take it to the grassroots, et cetera. And so in that discussion with those worker leaders and so on, we agreed that uh, as the CJCM, and I said, I'm coming to this meeting today, we will make a call uh, to workers. And I'm putting this on the agenda that we make a call to all the trade union movements in this country to adopt the charter seriously from affiliate level to federation level. And we actually put together a platform for working class unity, where all these federations, all these unions can work together with us as the CJCM around three problems, around inequality, around the deep just transition, and around strengthening our constitutional democracy. They were very, very excited with those three focus areas as the basis for campaigning. And so I'm sharing this with you here today as one thing I'd like to put into the discussion around how we build the climate justice charter movement. Uh, it is something I also want your feedback on together with all the other ideas that have been shared with you here today, uh, because I am invited to speak to FEDUSA, uh, another trade union federation next week. They've given us an hour slot uh, to speak on the climate justice charter movement, and I want to share this proposal with them. Um, uh, Comrade Ferial also spoke to SAFTU on Friday as well around some of these ideas. Comrades, it's open now for your feedback. Please put your comments in the chat line uh, or raise your hand. We'll give you the platform. Where to next for the CJCM? We really want to hear from you because this is going to guide us going forward. Over, over to you. Who's, who wants to take the platform? Please put up your hands. You can speak to the questions. You can speak to the inputs that have been given, the proposals made around how we build and so on. We are gonna crystallize this out into a document, a collective document, uh, which we'll then put out as well. Comrades, where to next? Any thoughts, any ideas? Are we all impacted by a long COVID comrades? Thoughts, comrades, thoughts, ideas. Comrade Fish, maybe I could start it. Um, go ahead, Ariel, go ahead. That's go okay. Ahead. I mean, I think that, you know, from the from the speakers, the youth, and uh, some of the, the other uh, uh, activists that 
you know, came up and, and we're chatting. I mean, I think that the, the one thing that seems to be a common thread is people are saying that we need to up the ante, so to speak. And, and I think that we need to, you know, it's, it's all good and well to, to do kind of like um, chain ourselves to gates and get arrested. And, and we, we can think about those kind of things. But I think it was uh, Natalie who talked about, about uh, mobilization and building a movement. And that is always hard work. And that is always a longer kind of pathway. I think we need to think of both. We need to do both, and I and I really think that um, we have submitted the the charter to Parliament. We haven't heard from them in a year. We, by the way, comments. We are going back to Parliament on the 9th of November, and and I think we need to demand a response. But I think we need to figure out how do we how do we do that? Do we just do we have um, each province has an activity every month? to kind of demand, but like really hard hitting events, not just a protest in the street. Like we really need to make ourselves heard, not harmful COVID wise, you know, all of that and responsible, but we really need some kind of, of a response because I'm really worried that um, the ANC government as it stands is really taking positions on energy and uh, that is that's going to lock us into carbon for decades and we need to be aware of that. Excellent, Ferial. So you're saying not just uh, symbolic activism, but something more. Karuna, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Charles, please enable Karuna to speak. Karuna, go Thanks, ahead. Vish. Thanks, Vish. Um, yes, I want to pick up from what Ferial's raised, and in particular, the way Parliament has just relegated the Climate Justice Charter to uh, the Committee on Environmental Affairs. Now, you know, environmental affairs may be the main lead uh, looking at... Uh, climate change, but uh, the impact of climate change is across the board. And we do know that local government just does not have sufficient climate mitigation strategies in place. And that's where people live. That's where everything happens. That's where you experience your energy crisis, your water shortages, and that's where there's a need to protect biodiversity because that's where vulnerable people live. So there are a number of other portfolios in parliament that need to look at the Climate Justice Charter. And I think we need to pick up the point that human settlements needs to look at it, uh, the, the local government needs to look at it, the oversight on local government, uh, the DTIC that brings in investments into the country and decides on industrialization uh, needs to be very, very sensitive to carbon neutral uh, activity and needs to start looking at how you promote uh, green technologies. So, you know, we need to lobby parliament a lot more aggressively around those issues and those particular, uh, the, the, the different portfolio committees. Um, so that's the, the one part that I fully agree with, uh, with Ferio. I, I think the other part is the issue of building a movement and uh, really synergizing the energies that everybody's been displaying in this assembly around the fact that we need to mobilize. But I think more important than mobilizing is we need to organize. And we need to build the awareness and conscientize people on what climate change is. And all three of those things are, are, is hard work, firstly. But secondly, you know, it, we need to do it all over the country. And then only will we be able, we, we, will we become a force to reckon with. Thanks, Fish. Thank you so much for that, Karuna. Uh, are there any other inputs, comments, and so on? 
we need to move towards a mass-based movement, disciplined, coherent. So we've got the charter. Uh, we've translated the concept of climate justice to our context. Um, but we need to get a mass-based movement anchored uh, in communities, in workplaces. Uh, we have to start working towards that, uh, institutionalizing this. But as Karuna says, it's got to be grounded in mobilizing, organizing, conscientizing. Lots of hard work to do here. Other comments, other inputs. What next? How do we build mass power, comrades? Because this is the only thing that's going to impact uh, the just transition. Any thoughts or oh, welcome? This, these ideas are also going to impact, as I said, how we programmatize what we do next year. Uh, so your, your feedback is very, very welcome. Comrades, any other thoughts? Shanaz, how do we get more children and youth activated? Popsy, what are, what are school children saying? Uh, how do we move uh, things forward? Seppo says, I like the concept of intersectionality as raised by Rainsa. This will send out a clear message to all sections of society. That climate justice is something we all should be concerned with and advocate for. As regards Parliament's response to the Climate Justice Charter, I'm in full support of increasing the volume and pressure of getting the parliamentarians to adopt the Charter. And as Natalie mentioned, we should point out to government how crucial it is for South Africa to follow an eco-friendly route. Great, great support. For, for some of the ideas that have come through. And it's important that we, we, inf we, we, we take those ideas forward in how we're thinking about tactics, how we're thinking about strategy, how we're thinking about movement building. Popsy, anything to say about what happened today with the learners and the children or um, Shanaz? Popsy, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, good afternoon, people. I'm so sorry that I haven't been speaking, but I'm tuned in. I'm actually driving to Isipingo and I'm listening um, to you. Uh, we had a very busy day today. I met with my kids at school and uh, we did a, uh, a recording session and a slideshow. I'm in the process of getting that all sorted out. And from there, I took my kids to the, to the child welfare um, uh, to work on, in the food garden and do a presentation there. We were a bit late in getting there, but we were the, the last group to come in. And um, my kids had a very, very big impact on the crowd that was gathered, gathered there. Their, their research basically was um, were done on their own. I just gave them material and they were very, very excited to see that the, 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 the audience stopped whatever they were doing. And they just sat down to listen to my kids who made their own posters, uh, et cetera. And while we were speaking, we had some of the media that came over to us and they want to visit our school on Monday, uh, saying that they want to take the school to the next level. And of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, our kids. And um, we are waiting, we, we are going to wait with bated breath to see how far we can take this. Uh, um, the, the, the school garden, uh, gardening and the climate justice charter um, our kids are very gung ho about it because um, one of the things that they were saying to me this morning while I was chatting uh, with them informally is that, um, you know, ma'am, the way we are going right now, we're not going to have much of a world to hand over to our children. And that for them, they, they were aghast uh, uh, at, uh, at the prospect of them, of there not being uh, a world for, for their kids. So, yes, I do agree. Our, uh, our movement should go grassroots to our kids, to our children. And the way to do that is through our unions. I do believe that SAF2 is very much into, um, into the climate justice charter. And I think we're going in the, uh, in the, right, in the right direction. Pardon me, I have to uh, carry on driving. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Popsy, for sharing and for your thoughts and guidance. And youth and children are very, very important for, for where we need to go. Dr. Matabula, please take the platform. Dr. Matabula, please unmute and take the platform. Dr. Matabula. Dr. 
Dr. Matabula, can you hear me? Hmm. Okay. Uh, for some reason, um, Dr. Matabula is not able to, to plug in. Uh, Charles, can you help? Or Dr. Matabula, are you there? Is the guy, Lord, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, thanks. Unfortunately, there was traveling. I didn't even yet. I didn't uh, manage to hear everything that was uh, discussed. Or maybe to say what I must engage on. I'm trying to certainly, at least to have an internet on my, the coverage it was poor. I was traveling. Okay. Uh, okay, doctor, I think you're coming in and out. Um, if you want to, you could put something in the chat line and so on. Um, is there anybody else who wants to share a thought around where we go to next? Shanaz says she's got to leave, but she's going to send us an input via email and upload stuff around national actions and the process, etc. Great stuff. Anybody else wants to share anything? Okay, anything from our panelists um, that are here today? Okay, any final comments? Um, Awande, Natalie, Stephen, any final comments from anybody? No. I'd like okay. to make a yeah. final comment. Go ahead, comment. Oh. Go, ahead Awande. go ahead, go ahead. I think uh, a lot of the, the inputs we've just received also are quite welcome. And I think one of the things that we can all anchor to is that there's an obvious agreement with regards to the necessity and the urgency with which we have to move things around, but that there's also a massive education, um, an education campaign that is required with regards to shifting these different segments of society uh, down the line of the climate justice path. Um, and I hope that um, everyone who's traveled with us thus far will continue to also heighten that work as we move forward. Yes, thank you for that intervention on one day. The movement is only as strong as its parts. So we each have a responsibility. We each have to build. We each have to raise consciousness. We each have to organize and so on. This is very, very important. It's not COPEC. It's not the few of us that are convening, et cetera. It's everyone that has to build. It's the many that are gonna determine the future of climate justice politics in South Africa. Now, comrades, I'm going to transition to closing the assembly. Uh, I think it's very, very clear from our international panel that uh, we are heading for a very, very serious crisis. The multilateral negotiations is shot through with power inequalities. And since 1992, there hasn't been any serious movement. Right now, in terms of commitments that are being made, only Gambia can prevent a 1.5 degree Celsius overshoot in terms of its commitments. The rest of the countries, despite the movement that's happening, is really not putting forward ambitious enough uh, emission cuts. We should expect COP26, as Nemo says, to produce a 2.6 degree overshoot uh, in the near period. We are heading towards very, very serious climate crisis. At the same time, I think the conclusion we can take away from that is that national politics is very, very important. Now, Charles shared with us his assessment of the party manifestos based on our climate justice charter, uh, emphasis, our systemic alternatives. And again, we have parties that are disconnected generally from the lives of the people. They are failing the people in terms of local governance, but they're also coming short against the, in terms of the biggest problem and the biggest challenge that we face, the climate crisis. And so please share the manifesto, the critique of the manifestos, put it out there, share it with your organizations, share it in your, in your communities, uh, and let's challenge the parties in this moment, we are calling on this from this platform for the local government elections to be climate justice elections. 
So when you when a politician comes to you or, or, or you meet them or you convene meetings and they come there, challenge them around the climate justice challenge. Where are they standing? How do they understand climate science? How do they understand the deep just transition? Are they serious about a people's alternative, the climate justice charter? So comrades, that's very, very crucial for our assembly here today. We are launching that critique of parties and we will put that out in the media and so on. I think what's very, very clear is that the one year that we've waited for our parliament to move uh, has revealed again, a serious crisis. We are in a process of clashing with South Africa's parliament. That's what's happening, okay. And so the struggle doesn't stop here. We are going to convene again on November 6th, and we're gonna use that moment to convene an alternative COP to 26. Uh, and we really like you all to mobilize. Uh, we really like you all to come to that. We're going to have a very interesting program that afternoon. We're gonna have a photo exhibition uh, by one of South Africa's up and coming photographers who's done some interesting work on coal and its impacts in Mpumalanga. We are going to have a, a panel of other young people uh, and maybe some of the people you've heard here today about broken promises, broken climate. How do we deal with this idea of failing leadership, okay? And then, of course, we're going to debate whether we are moving closer towards eco-fascism, eco-side, etc. And there again, we're going to have some very, very important contributions. And we're also then going to workshop with you some important tools that we've developed uh, to, to deepen the just transition from below, a point that has been made here by, by several activists. We have a lot of work being done on a climate justice deal for South Africa. A lot of efforts gone into that, soliciting research from leading heterodox economists, et cetera. And we want to launch this climate justice deal sometime next year. So we want to give you a taste of the work we've been doing and to get your feedback. We are going to also be sharing with you a people's planning tool for the deep just transition. And again, it's a workshop uh, and we'd like you to help us think around the concepts, the ideas, the tool we're developing and we will finalize after, after that, 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 that meeting. And then of course, we're gonna be uh, sharing with you a set of case studies around pathway building for food sovereignty. Many, many activists are doing amazing work at the front line. We saw that today on World Food Day. There are, over th there are almost 3 billion people hungry on our planet. That's not a cause for, for celebration, but actually, we must celebrate the alternatives we are building. And that's what many activists did today. So November 6th is very important for us. And then of course, on November 9th, we are going to parliament. We are going to form a human chain around parliament. And we'd really like as many of you as possible to be there. We'll be working very closely with Cape Town based organizations. We are convening a meeting with them on Monday to tighten up the organizing. We have uh, commitments from several organizations already to mobilize. We are, we've already hired the fire brigade that we are taking to, to parliament as well. And we'll be handing over gifts, not gifts that celebrate the so-called leaders in parliament, but we're actually going to give them gifts that confirm their carbon criminality. So that's going to be a very crucial moment for us to intensify this pressure. But the other point that came, that came through our discussions, comrades, is, is the movement building and what next. And there are some very, very important, very useful, very valuable ideas. So the next step from here is to crystallize this thinking. We'll put a collective document together around where to next for the Climate Justice Charter movement. It will serve both to clarify some of the things we do next year and beyond, but it will also serve as a basis for further debates. There are big issues to answer, and we've only started on that journey. Uh, we will also develop another tool for grassroots organizing and maybe a menu of tools informed by today's discussion. So that's very, very important in terms of the way forward. And then finally, I'd just like to give a vote of thanks to all the organizations that stepped up today for climate justice and for the Charter. There were numerous organizations that Charles mentioned um, at his opening that stood up today in communities from across the country. Uh, they've celebrated uh, their practice, their alternatives, they've done climate awareness raising, 
they've foregrounded the thinking of young people and their perspectives. Uh, they foregrounded, uh, if you like, important debates around alternatives, etc. And this is what this is about, a movement in action, a movement that is consciously uh, carrying society further forward. So that, I think, comrades, is something we must all acknowledge and appreciate. And thank you to those comrades. The other very important um, uh, group of comrades, we must thank our international guests who came here today, all very busy. Uh, Comrade Dorothy Guerrero, who is centrally involved in the COP mobilizations. Uh, thank you for making the time, Dorothy, and for your inputs. Uh, Comrade Nemo Basi, who was also one of our leading climate justice activists on the continent. Uh, big thank you to him as well. And of course, uh, to our comrades from the indigenous movement in Brazil. It's unfortunate we never had them here today because of technical difficulties, but we really tried hard and we tried our best. The Amazon is a tipping point for climate. We lose the Amazon, we lose everything, comrades. So what's happening there is very, very important for all of us. And the indigenous people struggles are very, very important for us to appreciate and to build solidarity around. Uh, so thank you uh, to those comrades and, and we stand with them. I think that's what we're saying on today's platform. Uh, a big thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for funding us, for the data, uh, for the program that we are running around building the movement. Uh, and, and finally, a big thank you to the COPAC team. Uh, a big thank you to Charles, Awande, and Ferio uh, for organizing us and for convening. Comrades, thank you for your time. Uh, please diarize November 6th, uh, mobilize, organize. Let's use that for conscientization. Let's use that for raising awareness. It's a people's alternative to COP26. And let's see you on the streets on November 9th in Cape Town at Parliament. Take care.